Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. If you're passionate about the tactical skirmish game that brings together strategy, lore, and creativity, you are in the right place. Don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, and stay updated with our latest episodes. If you want to support the show, check out our Patreon. Your support means a lot to us. Follow us by using the social media links in the podcast description for all the latest news, and be sure to leave a review to let us know what you think. Thanks for tuning in. Here's today's episode. Well, um, we're here. We're rolling. Welcome. Yeah, we've got Chris here from Alabama. Hello. One of the tournament organizers in the South. How's it going, man? I can't complain for a Sunday. How about you guys? It's been a busy weekend for Kill Team. Yeah, extremely busy. Yeah, I've missed out on, on the, a lot of the like Discord chatter as I've been pretty much nonstop working until a little bit ago. But I, I watched the preview and uh, read a couple of opinions, and I'm here ready to share more opinions. Yeah, we've got Hive Storm, the great gun. You know, taking a page out of effectively hell divers i think you know i don't think that they use hell divers as the assumption because i'm sure this graphic was done well in advance of hell divers ever being conceived just from how i understand physical production costs and timetables however seeing a big gun that you know it did give me some did, did give me some hell divers echoes because we did there is a mission like that on hell divers there's actually two of them you can load a gun and then another one you fire an icbm and you get the big the big wash of dust and as a tau player i gotta say i'm very excited because it's been it's been a hot minute since those vestment models came out and i never bought them when i was a kid because they were ugly as sin impossible <laughs> to find metal models and you know what they had quite the glow up yeah if even back then they were uh terrible looking models you know they're really uh not such a hotness but these new ones do look very cool yeah they're they're awesome how old are the old ones um they were old they were like a year or two old when i was a kid when i was like 16 so they're probably like probably pushing like just under 20 not quite as bad as eldari you know well eldar models can drive at this point <laughs> but as far as the baseless accusation goes if this edition for whatever reason focuses in on jump pack models you know there's a large skew of things that are jump pack adjacent that definitely need updates on the 40k side so if that is the through line that they're going to run through on this edition and there's no real reason to believe that there would be right you know this is a new venue with new stuff but if those baseless accusations and rumors are to be believed maybe new warp spiders those would be pretty hot the uh the jump pack boys storm boys that'd be cool storm boys yeah storm boys the warp spiders getting new raptors because while the raptors i think model wise hold up pretty well their legs are a little bit short so getting new ones there would be pretty hot and they are still pretty like old models like a lot of the chaos range has been refreshed and they do look like reasonably a decent bit better that'd be a cool like a five-man jump pack team i think i've said that a couple times would be a super cool kill team on that note assault intercessors sign me up yeah, those would be cool. And I guess they already exist, so they could just make rules for them, pretty much. Yeah, be really easy. Totally a little already have through. Them. And then people Edition like me that are kind of on the verge. Squad. Yeah, it's just like, I've been like on the verge of getting a squad of those for a while. And like, if they had rules in Kill Team, I would just like go buy a box today. Yeah, you know they want to sell more stuff, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, what were some of the things that jumped out to y'all from the uh, from the preview video? I actually even took notes. I'm going to pull them up. I think, you know, looking at the Vespid side, some of the things that they mentioned, you know, while moving, you get to boost some of your skills. So maybe you get better ballistic skill. Maybe you get better armor penetration. I think they, in the video, specifically called out that as you move, you improve your guns. So I doubt it's damage, but it could be cool if it was an AP thing. So maybe it goes from nothing to P1 to AP1. There could be a nice way to show, like, if you move more, like, maybe there's, like, movement ranges where you get the thing. Um, the other thing that I thought was pretty cool was just how the models, like, you've got the stealth suit and the helmet, and they integrate into the Vespid. And they mention how you give out command points, so maybe kind of like a Hernkin's 
Hernkin role where you have a couple points and then if you give those points you can do mission actions and you can fully control your model or maybe it's just like within six of the helmet it's hard to hard to really piece out what's going on especially without the rest of the skeleton so i think right now it's very easy to jump to conclusions because there was a single picture that shows the new scouting options and it says you know one is a new equipment two i think is a free stratagem so on the strategic ploys you get a free one and then three is the three inch dash or fly or recon dash but it's very hard for us to actually know if anything is good or bad based on just that one small snapshot yeah yeah fly fly seems to be different just just assume, uh, just assumptions based on how they treated white dancers and there's a whole team of 10 or 11 models of fly probably slightly different maybe more like 40k yeah where you're paying diagonal inches it could just be like how the void dancers work right now where effectively all of your movement penalties are just two inches which would still be pretty powerful if you had a whole team of it because as we've seen in our week to week podcast on patreon the void dancers haven't actually done that much worse over time like they are not going to win any big tournaments because they're crippled by being eight models but being able to avoid a lot of the penalties of moving around objects is a thing that you can bake into how you imagine playing them and is still very powerful when you do it correctly yeah yeah and this terrain seemed pretty dense so the ability to move a little bit faster definitely adds up yeah my my big thing is that the terrain looks freaking sick and i'm super excited to just get my hands on a new set of terrain that finally we can give up on octarius on some level because i'm (laughs) I'm tired of playing on it yeah it's uh it looks like a welcome replacement to octarius like uh, better than anything has, you know, gotten close to before. Uh, I think it's going to be well received. People are, are hopefully going to love it, get a lot of it floating around, and be the new standard. Yeah, I am kind of, I am kind of curious, Chris, on the Alabama scene. What kind of terrain do you guys use? Are you guys using like a mix, or is it like a tons of Octarius? Because you know, big GW events are all Octarius, and I know a lot of other events kind of use Octarius ish events. Uh, what do you guys like in Alabama? Uh, I mean, it's mostly mixed, so it's ITD and either a mix of Octarius or similar style terrain. We've used um, ton of stuff, but not all of the heavy terrain in there, just because it's a little bit too heavy. But pretty standard tournament terrain, I would say. Nice. So everyone's looking forward to the new terrain. What do you guys spot on the Tempesta Scions spot? From the way Elliot was talking about some of these drop drop events... Could be pretty annoying. You know, he did specifically call out melta guns, melta buttons, and crack grenades, just basically popping out of low orbit and just dunking people while you're following these these drop tokens, which definitely, while he was describing them, reminded me of Fortnite or any of these other, you know, drop in games that have been popularized over the last, you know, maybe decade of gameplay on PC games. Yeah, I mean, that looks like a really cool mechanic. So kind of like for anyone that hasn't already heard, it sounds like generally you can like place a few drop tokens and you can move them around and uh, you remove some of them. So it kind of zeroes in on where you're landing. And then when it's like like when you have an opportunity or when it's time or when you're forced to or whatever, then you can like put a an airborne unit on that token and it can be up to a third of the team, I think is what he said it was going to be a third of the team and if we have 10 models it'll be like three or four model or we it would be three models probably yeah i'm i'm hoping that uh the footprint or you know the area you need to be within when you can drop on the token is not too far too wide but just given that one of them can drop into engagement range (laughs) if you can just put all those tokens on objectives then you're literally saying hey Wherever you go, I'm going to drop down, double strike you, probably kill you, take the objective. That's That seems kind of crazy. But we'll it's see. very strong. Yeah. I wonder if they're going to be at the 8 operative line or the 10 operative line. Because at 8 operatives, a single dude who can come out of drop and immediately kill a dude is good, but immediately gets punished and maybe it's fine. Whereas at 10 models, it will, I suspect if... If all of the assumptions about how Kill Team kind of function right now continue, then 10 models with a third of them dropping in probably will feel a little overwhelming. If it's eight models or nine models, maybe it's not that bad because you only get like two models dropping at a time and it's you pick the precursor and like a melt of mine and you kind of adjust from there. But it's really hard for us to make any real guesses. It's all we're all in baseless assumption territory right now. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to say it here. Nine models is what I'm expecting. And one of those is going to be a servo skull, which they did call out in that 30 minute segment on Warcom can double shoot. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. Hopefully it's slow. It looks kind of slow. 
wouldn't be surprised if it was like stationary yeah it could be i suspect it'll move around a little bit but maybe it'll mm-hmm. be like a four inch move and then it might have the servitor role where if you don't have someone within three inches or six inches it can only ha- get one apl but it, the fact that they he did say that it could double shoot with a las volley you know five attacks if all of the rules come over from kill team 2021 five attacks on fours or threes three four damage p1 is a real profile especially if you can yeah. do it twice yeah speaking of four inches how do you feel about uh four inches instead of two circle I mean, uh, it's AKA. time you know <laughs> It's time for us to finally move into the realm of actual numbers. It was great at Gen Con. I was teasing new people while I was doing demos. Like, obviously, we all know that a six inch should be determined by a five <laughs> five sided shape. And then if you add in one circle, you get nine. <laughs> a nine inch threat range. It's all so obvious, everybody. <laughs> but I'm glad we're finally free, free of the ridiculousness of these in- these shapes that make absolutely no sense. Yeah, I, I didn't hate playing with them, and I kind of got used to it anyway, but teaching new players, that especially if they come from 40k or other Warhammer games, is just, uh, it's not the best way to transition into a new game, Yeah, relearning like, numbers. No new players were giving the shapes any slack at all. They're just like, why is it shapes and not numbers? And then we're like, that's not the thing you're supposed to focus on. And now we just <laughs> totally don't have to worry about that at all. Yeah, we do get two entirely new sprues according to what they showed off in the box. They get two different token punch out sheets. We've got instead of moving from the triangles, we have the semi circle things that attach to our bases, which is kind of neat. And then we have physical tokens for terrain, which I am not looking forward to personally as far as transporting because now to carry around a big box of jangly stuff. Are you talking yeah, about like the smoke like grenade that. things and all that? Smoke grenades, ladders, heavy heavy barricades. It looks like wide heavy barricades, small barricades, ladders, tank, you know, barbed wire. Like I got no idea what we're doing, and I have no idea how that equipment is going to get used. But having to carry more stuff is going to be kind of annoying. I think. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could just plan to use one or two and throw them in with your models. Be like, you know what? Uh, I'm I'm really just only going to do barbed wire these days. Or just, like, only ladders. I don't know. Two options. Just a couple things to bring. But then also, like, I'm assuming there's going to be a starter pack. Like, if the starter pack maybe has, like, the terrain sprues and the tokens or something, if it's going to be, like, universal equipment that everyone's going to want to have, you probably want that available in more than just the launch box. I think they did call out that there is going to be a separate release that comes out pretty soon, which is that sprue of terrain plus the punch punch out tokens. And it does sound like they're really going to make sure that the game is accessible, because right now, I think the biggest issue I've had over the last year of Kill Team, I don't know if this has been the case in Alabama, but it's definitely been the case in New York, is when a new person wants to play the game, you're like, well, let me get this extra box, these three books, look up this thing online for the FAQs and the downloads, and then when you get onto the table, well, make sure that your opponent... It's just like an infinite spread of things that just people, their eyes roll into the back of their heads, and you're like, I thought this game was supposed to be chill. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it's definitely extremely not chill. Yeah, and you know, we, we try to make stuff available for people that come oh, in want to try the game because we have a good bit of extra ter- uh, terrain and teams. But yeah, not having online rules and having to go different places to find different bits is definitely not uh, not not the best. I was going to say, the, the starter set at least was nice for Kill Team 2021. Like, it's still something that I would recommend people to get if they don't have anything and they want to start for cheap. So hopefully they have something like that for this edition. Yeah, agreed. Um, pretty jazzed about the concept of the rules all being available for free online starting day one because before it was like people would be like oh, I want to play Necrons what book do I need and it like was, <laughs> it's not like immediately obvious by the name of the book and like the book is kind of expensive it has more than what you need if you're trying to do just one thing not great for casuals so this is yeah super 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 enormously way more accessible like especially if you've been in the game for a while and you haven't like looked at the scope of how hard it is to get in this is a huge upgrade yeah it's honestly just like this huge change from the games workshop side because i know obviously we've been playing i've been on and off with games workshop stuff for a long long time and this feels like a big shift between age of sigmar 40k and kill team all kind of moving in the direction of let's make sure that people can play our game and then the mini stuff will happen organically because people who want to play mini stuff obviously gw has a good good spread for minis but now if you want to play we're not going to put this huge wall and if you want to buy stuff go for it but 
the game will help drive the sales just because the game is sick. Yeah, I'm very excited. Does anyone have any like top things that they're looking forward to from what they previewed on the Hivestorm stuff before we hop into maybe some of the topics for today's podcast? Um, let's see. I have written a couple things down, but maybe we checked it all out. Um, yeah, I mean, like we kind of already talked about the models look cool. The he said the core rules are slimmed down, so hopefully that's easy to read, easy to get through. Um, solo and co-op mode, amusing. Yeah, I thought the prisoner situation from the White Dwarf actually was a pretty nice intro event for players because we ran an event where we did. The prisoner situation where there's one psyker and 10 kind of goons and you fight two opposing kill teams at the same time. And those teams job is to go get the psyker and pull them off the map and you play them in the dark. So the vision rules are pretty basic. And then as you play the game, the prisoner gets to basically run administrator for the two players and you can show off all the mechanics. And at the end of it, someone gets to feel like they did a thing unless the prisoner manages to score a win, which from what we've seen is very, very hard as a 10 wound model with 10, seven wound, five up save dorks with that. Everyone hits on fours. Yeah. Yeah. That mission was fun. Definitely fun for new players. But yeah, I would, I would, I guess agree that the, the co-op stuff is pretty cool. I'm excited to kind of use that to teach people how to play. And not have, maybe hopefully not have to explain uh, stuff like obscurity and things like that. We'll, we'll see how, how that plays out. Yeah, I'm very curious to see how new obscurity plays out, whether or not it actually goes away or it becomes slimmed down. So it's just not as overbearing because I think right now it does represent a very big level up when a player starts thinking about not just cover, but obscurity. And it does let you feel like, oh, man, I'm making these important decisions. And it is nice, especially when things can ignore obscurity. But it is also one of those things that people just hate because you're like, what? You shoot me and then I just can't shoot you. That's rude. Yeah, that and, and the fact that those rules are uh, it's kind of like for the 40K issue where you have rules in four different documents and it's, you know, oh, did you download the correct version of it? Like if you go in the latest uh, FAQ and erratas, there's no mention of the the vantage point obscurity rule where like even players that are grinders don't know that rule like no yeah if you're if you're on top you don't get obscurity but if i'm below i do get obscurity from you it's really weird and i don't convoluted yeah i've always described it as if you're standing on top of the box you can still be obscured by the floor underneath you but everyone shooting up at you can see you just fine that doesn't make it any easier but at least it is consistent so So it sounds like Alabama has got a pretty good tournament scene if you guys are getting into the nitty gritty on the vantage stuff, because that is obviously a rule that a lot of players misplay. So for anyone who doesn't know, you know, even though things are going to be changing out pretty soon, it sounds like when you're shooting on top of a piece of vantage, the thing that you're on top of does obscure you. So a lot of Octarius shots or if you're standing on top of a Munitorum container, if you take a shot across the thing, generally you're actually obscured because there is you're not able to shoot past a one inch bubble around your base, yeah. which can be very upsetting, especially when people walk into it and you're like, well, sorry, you can't shoot. I'm just going to blow you up. But <laughs> intervening pieces of heavy still do the thing. Yeah. So while the thing you're on top of doesn't do anything, everything else still does it. So it can be a situation where people think they learn it and then it shows up as, oh, actually, I learned it the wrong way and now I'm dead. Yeah. The, the the one of the fun ones is uh, Octarius scrap piles where you can uh, you can dash and then charge over and it's one of the only occasions in which you can do any move other than a charge in the same activation. That one's kind of funny. That is kind of funny. Yeah, I am looking forward to seeing how that new terrain interacts with maybe some of this kind of stuff because I assume scrap piles are going to go away, uh, especially mm-hmm. if they don't reprint Octarius anytime soon. Although. Personally, I'm I'm glad I'm done with Octarius. I've been playing on it for two years and uh, the missions have been played around for so long. I'm looking forward to hopefully they go the way of 40K and they reduce the number of objectives just to really make sure that people can't just sit in the background and just try to play a 3-3 split. Yeah, some like four, five and six objective missions, maybe even three. Yeah, our number is nice because it's it really forces you not to have a drop. <laughs> <laughs> Got to have a plan. Got to have a plan to get in there. And I think one of the screenshots they showed on the Hivestorm release was something around when the mission's being a kill tally. So definitely really po- putting the focus on kill team and not points team. Yeah, that's one of the things they mentioned in the 
in the interview as well was uh we're putting the kill back and kill team uh yeah, score points by killing things universal thing meanwhile jason's been doing that for the entirety of the year with intercession squad phobos and all sorts of marines just turning on engage and just blowing people up that's true i mean it is called kill team and i just always took that personally <laughs> What is the actual meta out in Alabama, Alabama like? You know, I think in the wider meta, elites have obviously taken a bit of a lick in and wider teams have done much better. I'm curious how the Alabama scene shakes out. Is, are Brood Brothers and Mandrakes taken over over there as well? Or do you guys have a wider spread? How's your player base? Definitely a wider spread. And we don't have, we don't really have like meta chasers. Um, I don't even really consider myself a meta chaser. And, but I do pretty much buy almost every set that comes out. So I have access to most teams. Um, but yeah, I would say most people just kind of play, they stick to one team or two and try to get better at it. But they're not always playing the best team that comes out. Yeah, I honestly think that's like the best way to actually get good. Um, there's a lot of good players that just like stick with the team. And there's so much nuance to learn within every team that there's a lot of value from just playing it a lot agree yeah as long as the team is good and can play the game generally you don't need to go meta chasing however there's never been a real issue with ah this brood brother stuff is really good right now if i can do the the solid basic plan of using their best tools very easily maybe it's fine but there are players like shane you know of command point who took a small tournament last weekend at salt city playing felgor a team that's been nerfed a million times now and he was still able to make a clean sweep through the tournament because it turns out dying dying more than once is definitely still a powerful ability even if you get nerfed yeah 100 percent. yeah and it's not even just that i think some older teams still hold up pretty well you know pathfinders had to take a couple nerfs obviously we're gonna talk about novitiate today because chris that's the team that you say is near and dear to your heart you have the most experience on and they've obviously been nerfed a couple times but at this point they haven't really been touched for a while and faith dice remain very very powerful oh yeah they're so great i would say they actually got a few buffs maybe in the past year uh or so you think the meta game has shifted around the novitiates in a way where the novitiates can hang out a little bit more at the upper ends of the tables uh I think it was actually a lot easier right before cults cultists came out when the when the meta was more mid rangey and uh elite now that it's mostly you know go wide team it's a little bit harder of course cuz you're outnumbered and pretty fragile that's true uh novitiates being 10 models 7 wounds 4 up saves means that they really can't take too much of a punch but they do have one of their better tools with blinding aura just meaning they don't take punches yeah, and it's always fun to explain how that interacts with uh, vantage points and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, in general, Novitius is kind of one of those teams that I'm like, is I've always been like a little, a little spooked by them just because it can really, really mess up your day if you fall for the blinding, the blinding aura. Then you're just can. It's really easy to just like catch people out with that. Like even after you fall for it a couple times and then just fall for it again in the same game it's like it's a strong ability i'm actually curious chris you know you're one of the leaders of your scene how do you do you play novitiates and when you play those intro games with players how do you kind of walk players through the gotchas of novitiates because novitiates are a team with a lot of gotchas and for any listeners who don't know them really well you know it'd be kind of interesting to see how you would teach those people to play around your rules yeah, they have uh, a ton of gotchas, and obviously if I'm teaching the game or if I'm playing local games, you know, the weekly games and stuff, I pretty much don't play them issues. I only play them in tournaments because they're, uh, they're, they can be frustrating to newer players or even somebody just trying to have a good time. You know, it's not fun to sit there for an hour and say, well, you know, I can do this, this team can do that. And you're like, so I can't shoot you, I can't do this, I can't do this. Like, yeah, sorry. Um but in tournaments, I usually try to go over everything that I can do and all the cheese, at least. Um, it's Obviously, it's hard to explain every scenario of things that I can do. And like when it comes up in a game, I say, hey, you know, careful. Remember, I can back a dash with these two flavors. So I have like a 15-inch range. So, you know, maybe don't worry about that cover so much because I'll be within two inches of you type stuff. But there are, there's a lot of gotcha, so... 
Yeah, the power of the per, the pair of pergodises, one of them shooting like a bolter is always going to be something that's very powerful. Do you have a way that you would describe novitiates to a brand new player, maybe like a one in one minute spiel of like what are we what's the vibe of the novitiates? Oh man. Um they look extremely unassuming and their stats are all pretty weak, but they actually hit like trucks and they have a ton of tricks. They're like one of the trickiest teams for sure in Kill Team. I agree. And one of the hardest hitting teams. Like you actually, like you trade pound for pound with the the best offensive teams in the game easily. Yeah, like that flamer is so so reliable. It's it's five dice on twos, rerolling ones, three four inferno tokens, and inferno tokens do mortal wounds at the end of the turn. So it's like you can you can roast a space marine with that. Yeah, sometimes it's ten attacks uh, plus the inferno tokens. Um, so I, I've definitely one shot at legionaries with just the flamers with a uh, defenders of the faith into first activation, and just murder it. Yeah. And then your plasma leader is probably the best gunner in the game. Unlimited range, hitting on twos, guaranteed. You like ninety something percent to kill anything in the game, pretty much, except for uh, the nightmare hulks. Yeah, and you've got like dice manipulation and rerolls, so it, it really is just totally bonkers. And then that with Defenders of the Faith is totally insane. Um, if you if you can pull it off, you at the very end of the turn run out and shoot, stand on an objective and shoot someone. And then when the turn comes back around and you've just been stockpiling your CP, um, use your uh, Eyes of the Emperor for unlimited range and uh, Defenders of the Faith so that you can activate with a, a free shoot or fight before the turn starts so it doesn't matter who has initiative you just shoot again with this super plasma like against elites it's just like it's an easy way to kill two space marines guaranteed just no problem yeah they're they're pretty insane i, I always feel like when i'm playing them i'm playing chess and a lot of times when i lose it's definitely because of mistakes i made because you really have a way to guarantee just about anything you want to do. Like if you have a plan and you execute it correctly, it will happen just because of the faith points. Um, so really a lot of the times when you lose, it's just because of the mistakes you make, not, you know, you never get unlucky playing them. Obviously they're fragile. So you're kind of trading the, uh, the insurance of killing stuff with also dying very easily. So if you make, mis- if you make mistakes, you get punished really hard. So that's one of the drawbacks, but. Yeah, they they do kind of have like some deceptively high durability against things that don't have AP because a four up armor save with rerolls ends up actually being more reliable than three up armor. Yeah, yeah. If if you don't have any AP or P1 or anything like that, they're very tanky. Yeah, I think high AP and using AP where possible is actually one of the biggest tips against novitiates. Sure, everyone knows that AP is really good, but when the novitiates can strip and reroll your dice just doing three normal hits or four normal hits is not generally going to do enough against their four up save. It sounds like maybe it should go down, but when you can reroll or force a miss to go into a normal save, you really want to be looking for criticals and AP to actually reduce the amount of dice that your opponent is allowed to roll because no fish hits cheat. <laughs> we don't cheat. We just slightly bend the rules. Yeah. The faith of the emperor lets you adjust your dice. And you know what? <laughs> it turns out that's very good when your opponent's just landing normal hits. Yeah. Yeah, I would say their greatest weakness is definitely melee. So if you, if you have a few operatives that can, and really almost every kill team has a few melee-centric operatives, you just need to fight them the right way, you know, keep your distance and then close in and kill them in combat. Yeah, the tough part is getting there because the flamers just, like, can get the, can, they can non-reciprocal threat range you, and then same with the uh, eviscerator character with the, like, 20,000-inch charge. <laughs> yeah, the penitent is... uh pretty good counter to that yeah so it definitely feels like kind of more of like a hang back like don't if if you're staging threats in the mid board that is too aggressive because you can really just catapult people so you just like catapult from the back hit people from like non-reciprocal threat ranges yeah and it is hard to counter that range because you know even on a terrace you can try and block doors but then i can block doors on the other side and then you have to go all the way around to you know get rid of my threat there's there's a lot in play to all maps, except for Beta Decima. Yeah, I think Novitiates in the past had struggled when Intercession Squad was able to reduce damage and Legionary was able to cut you down to two damage and then the Flamers weren't nearly as scary. Nowadays, those days are mostly gone. The Novitiates do hunt in a better 
zone than they used to. Unfortunately for them, Commandos and Felgor still exist, and those guys two-shotting any of your Seven Moon operatives still remains mighty annoying for a Novitiates player. Yeah, all the all of the Horde melee matchups are uh, pretty scary. Yeah, in those situations, do you have models that you like to send as bait to get your opponent to come out, or are you mostly relying on your non-reciprocal threat ranges on your Penitent and the pair of Pergodises to really get the jump on your opponent? Uh, I I generally have some uh, bait models because I pretty much never play the medic in those matchups, and that comes in for a militant to actually has a pretty good melee profile at four three four five balanced. Um, so that's usually one of the trade pieces because one for one with commandos is not bad. It's it's bad when you get two for one, which definitely can happen with a uh, crumpum and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's definitely a team that has some rough matchups but for the most part against the 10 wound and the 14 model teams you've still always got some play obviously vet guard and pathfinders generally tend to run a couple issues just because they out activate you and they can punish you a little bit but like you said on octarius if you hide behind doors you can at least not get shot until you go in first so it's really about threatening the two for ones where you can because you've got a pair, couple models that can do you've got two models that can comms and then you've got the leader who's got the ap2 two up save plasma gun when especially when you give it the eyes of the emperor to give it infinite range so you've got a lot of good threats to run amok with yeah there's there's definitely plenty of opportunities to two for one in in the 14 and 12 model matchups for sure but one of the other teams that you've been playing as of uh, le- recent history has been Hearthkin Salvagers, a team that, as far as me and Jason can tell on the week-to-week stats, have kind of had a little bit of a resurgence. You know, they were taken at the World Team Championship by Alexa, I think, the World Championship winner, where he won. I think he only lost one matchup. Maybe he didn't even lose that one matchup. And they've been doing well. You know, out in the Midwest of America, there's a player, Dylan G, who came to ACO, got, I think, third, but was in contention for first place running around on the hearth salvagers doing their thing what do you where do you kind of position the salvagers in the meta right now uh i like them i think they're they're really good they they kind of remind me of innovations in a way maybe that's why i like them so much uh they're just a little bit more resilient um and they're also more versatile because you could your whole team could just be a melee threat if you want them to be which is kind of crazy with the knights Plasma eyes are so good. <laughs> so what's the biggest thing that kind of glues the vibe to make them feel like novitiates? Um, I, I think it's the fact that he, they don't look, they don't look crazy on paper, but they have a bunch of tricks and um, they, they punch up like their, their melee is really good because of the plasma knives that you can give them. And uh, their shooting is obviously really good. And you don't, you don't cheat. You don't cheat dice with uh, faith points, but you do get a bunch of crits. Uh, and, it, and with uh, proximate firepower, you you hit on threes and you crit a lot. And novitiates kind of like to push up the board, and you can't play. I, I think people played pretty slowly with uh, Arkin before, and I mean, obviously they're slow. They're slow teams. So it's hard to play fast, but you really want to push up and be aggressive with them. Yeah, because the, the knives help you get there. Oh yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I guess the grudge tokens is the mechanic of just getting tons of free crits is pretty similar to the faith token of just like you can also guarantee success. Yeah, one hundred percent. And you got the reroll token stuff. There's there is so many tricks with that team. Yeah, I have more tricks than the issues to be honest. Yeah, one of the biggest differences obviously is mobility because you've got the Daka dash on the Pergatus and like you don't really have anything like that. The closest you have is the the jetpack dude. Um the but that's just one guy. And he can't really do the twelve inch jump and still shoot or fight. Yeah, he 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 can he can shoot at least, he but yeah, he can't fight. I guess maybe he could on into the dark boost and then hatchway fight or something. Oh maybe, yeah. But. We'll but crafting. yeah, definitely more limited on as far as that goes. But you have crazy stuff like the the grenade, like you can just zone an area out. It's there's so many tools. It's like a I don't know. I like teams that have a lot of tools, like a nice kit. I feel like Arth can have one of the biggest um, kit kit bags, I guess. 
They've got right. access to ignore obscuring in two different ways. There's the gunner that just passively does it built in. And then there's, uh, who is it? The surveyor that places a token. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and like the way that, yeah, the way that surveyor token works is actually kind of like better than, than any of the other like aspects mechanics. Cause you just place a token anywhere. You don't need to see it. And then anyone, any enemies within range of that token, it's, what is it? Like three inches. It's like a pretty big bubble even, uh, yeah. can't be obscured. So then you, like, if people sort of cluster up and it doesn't even have to be that far, because this is going to be like a six inch bubble, you can get capture like multiple enemy operatives in it. And then you can just like light them up for like just peeking corners and non reciprocal shots. Yep. And no cover with P1 is really good. Like, all your guns are super deadly. Especially like, before P1 is no joke. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned that you like teams with a wide toolbox, and Hearth can salvagers have some of the most text per operative, I think, in the entire game right now. <laughs> Do you have any tools that you find yourself using all the time? I know you just mentioned the Grenadier, and we talked about the boost booster a little bit on the jump pack, but I'm and Jason just talked about the no obscurity bubble, but that's not it. There's even more tools than that. Do you have one out of the rest of the operatives that you find yourself using often? Oh, good question. Uh, honestly any operative just with deploys you have to because you can you can move dash and shoot something you can do free mission actions with the lugger and charge and fight there's so many there's so many different things you could do i would say probably just getting a free shooter fight action is the biggest one but even snagging objectives on death is kind of crazy yeah that's actually a fun spot because on the more recent faq they actually just opened up the window for a worth it so if you have the dozer who can strike on death it creates a new window after you strike and remove an operative where you can still call worth it so a dozer who's about to die can strike with his one remaining hit kill his opponent because there's no one left he can slam the button on before he passes on an objective and say it was worth it and then disappear along with your opponent and score an objective yeah that's that's Wait pretty a second wild. that's totally bonkers <laughs> what is this worth it is that like a tactical ploy uh, yeah, it lets you make a mission action when you die, basically. So you either you're hit on death, kill the thing that just killed you, and then you still get to loot. Okay, wow. Uh, I don't know how I haven't come across that. I, I mean, I don't think that that ploy came up nearly as much as it may come up now with the dozer, but yeah, it's it's in there. It's a tool that you can use. Yeah, uh, I, that was actually going to be one of my questions. Like, do you play the dozer? Uh, he seems like one of the cooler guys on the team. I'm curious if you... If you play him, and uh, if you think he's cool also. Uh, depending on the matchups I do play him, uh, but it, it really does depend on what, what you're up against. Um, the ability to move things off objectives is like can be valuable. I would say he's one of those flex slots, though. Like, he's not my whatever. Like, yeah, he's not like an auto-take. Yeah, but that definitely makes him a little bit better. Yeah, there's definitely some fun positional stuff you can do with the dozer where you can push people off objectives or now you can die on an objective so it makes a very good objective holder especially against the melee horde army so like something like felgor or brood brothers or blooded who want to come in and touch you you can set up a dozer and really give your opponent an awkward time if they try to steal an objective from you right yeah and if you push them off the objective and then they retaliate and kill you you can still like tap the objective after you died you know maybe you didn't have the apl to do it before but you can still do, do it for free for or for one cp i guess so. Yeah, there's there's a lot of cool stuff you can do. Yeah, effectively, you get an opening where the dozer can charge, kill a guy, and then because there's no one left on there, you can worth it now. So make sure anyone who's interested in Hearthkin to, you know, fire away and do that because there's not a lot of teams that can have tricks like that. As far as some of the other tools that you've got access to, you've got some of the best guns in the game. And one of the things that we like to call it is fun little tricks. So the plasma beamer, for anyone who doesn't realize, make sure that you're always looking for shots on grudge targets with the plasma beam because you do basically get a guaranteed chance at some D3 mortal wounds, right? Yeah, that thing is deadly. You, know, you, you can play around it, but if you don't play around it, you're in for a rude awakening for sure. You, uh, for anyone that doesn't know, you draw a line straight from where you're shooting through the target that you're shooting, and then that line can harm other people, uh, sprinkle a couple of mortal wounds when you get some crits. Yeah, and it's not like a one time, it's not one or more crits, it's every crit, so if you have a bunch of grudge tokens and mm -hmm. something that's in line, you can get a bunch of D3s. That could, like, fully kill a, a weak or injured operative. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you can do and cool one stuff. of the 
one of the fun little stories on Kill Team history is that when the team was first released before they released the first FAQ, everyone was wondering how the plasma beam worked. And a lot of people thought it was, you know, you would always hit the main target. You'd hit the guys in front or the guys behind it or maybe some other weird combination of but you would always hit the original target with those D3 extra wounds. And then on that first FAQ, they're like, ah, it turns out the main target never gets hit by the beam. It's always the people in front and behind him. Yeah, which, fun little piece of Hearthkin history. Yeah, I, I would say if you if you get a few crits on that target with AP two, it's probably dead anyway. But I I'm sure it's come up a few times where that definitely mattered and it was played incorrectly. Yeah, and the salvagers definitely have been the recipient of a lot of buffs. I think the newest one is Force Field, where the first time an attack does four more damage, you get to shrug the first four damage attack and that's definitely got to have helped the hearth and salvager players who've been playing them all over the world yeah those changes were huge um being able to play your leader a little, a little bit more aggressively too is super nice because you want to obviously get in with the the multifaceted threat of good melee and uh the shots yeah, have you found any big situations where some of the new buffs on hearth and salvagers have come up in recent history yeah the minus one damage on objectives is definitely it it messes up with a lot of uh melee weapon breakpoints and it kind of gives you makes you like you know a three hit in melee instead of two hits which is huge that is huge. especially when you have a plasma knife and you're getting charged and then you get two crits from grudges and they're the ones that die after charging yeah a two to three hit difference is a 50 percent increase yeah it also gives your opponents a lot more fail cases when they go into melee with four attacks, right? So unless you have five attacks, there's a lot of times where, oh, suddenly you're either taking more damage or sometimes you just don't kill a dwarf. And now you've got an angry dwarf and you're choosing between a grudge or getting stabbed by a knife. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's not fun when you charge into something and you have to parry. Like, oh, that was not the plan. Yeah, and getting into a shootout against the Hearthkin Salvagers tends not to be a winning combination because while they hit on fours, generally you'll have hit your strategic ploy, which is while you're within six, get plus one ballistic skill. So generally, the Hearthkin Salvagers want to be in close, taking shots and charging while your opponent is doing the same. And if you're getting a chance to trade back and forth and you're getting reduced a little bit of damage, you are making the breakpoints very awkward as the Hernkin, Hernkin Jaegers have shown on their end, where reducing the first hit by two damage generally means that they're not dying all that often, and every once in a while they get a heal. But the Hearthkin Salvagers, they get a medic, so in those shootouts, they do have the ability to just trade up, just like some of the other teams with medics. Yeah. Yeah, Jaegers are uh, pretty crazy. I haven't played against them much, but they're they're pretty cracked. I played against somebody who tried him for like the second time, maybe, and I was just, I didn't really look at the, uh, I guess, review or the rules and stuff, and I was like, what does this team do? It is a team that requires you to look at so many different things, because each of your operatives has a huge brick of text, because I think on release, they were thinking, well, you know, you only have four inches of movement, so it's going to take a little bit more work for you to work on stuff. But nowadays, that has kind of gone away, and they have a lot more power. You know, moving up with for five inches, all their guns are really good. Being able to get grudge tokens means that you really are a good shooting team, and enough plasma knives means you're respectable in melee. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, your your melee a lot of times is five five, just because of all the grudge tokens you can stack on a target. You get a bunch of rerolls if you want. It's... Yeah, that can end up being scary against like any target. Like I, uh, I was playing intercession against salvagers um, like a week or two ago, and just like there's an intercessor that has like four grudge tokens, and it's like, oh yeah, if you melee me, you just get all crits. Uh, the tilting shield will solve that, but if you don't, uh, it's a bad time. <laughs> yeah, and that's definitely a matchup where stacking uh, tokens on one operator is obviously very helpful. Yeah. Um, what do you think yeah. are some of the toughest matches for the Salvagers? And some of the easiest? Uh, easiest. I don't mind playing against Hordes, because um, you, you still have a decent amount of bodies, and you're not as fragile as Novitiate, so you can you can trade two for ones or one for O's a lot more often. Um, definitely more two for ones, just because you you probably don't die from the first retaliation. 
Um, I would say tougher would probably still be the aggressively good melee teams, or even something like uh, Galar Pox if, the, if your opponent is really good and spaces things out correctly. Uh, it's you know where they make it so you can't two for one them as much. It's a little bit more complex. If we had a ploy to shoot into melee, maybe. <laughs> Or something like where the Hern can get to shoot as you or opponent makes a charge. You can have a guy yeah. cover for you. But unfortunately, the Hearth can salvagers don't get that. They just have to tough it out with their operatives. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to complain. They're, they're good where they are, I think. Yeah, and they're actually one of the teams that theoretically kind of plays around with the roster restrictions a little bit. Who knows if that's going to change with Kill Team 24. You know, it does feel like a lot of the newer teams on release have kind of done away with the roster system. So I'm curious to see if Hearth can Salvagers on the new edition are going to run into roster restrictions. That's interesting. I didn't think about that. Hmm. Not an issue for Novitiates. Definitely not. Novitiates <laughs> got their 10 operatives. I mean, technically you could take auto guns, but I don't think I've ever seen someone decide to really take a lot of dorks on the novitiates because they really don't get a lot of value out of just a basic novitiate. Yeah, well, that, as an emperor, you pretty much just take the melee operative and then give them give her a limited range anyway. Yeah. They, they did hint at changing some of the data cards, and I wonder if that has to do just with updating the symbols. I mean, obviously, that's going to be a change, putting inches instead of the symbols. But I wonder if you're going to change any of the operatives to match the new rules. It kind of seemed like it. Who knows? Yeah. Um, and I mean, like the trends that we've seen in like Age of Sigmar 4th edition and Warhammer 40k 10th edition is kind of like this like streamlining where, um, you know, like 9th to 10th edition 40k was basically like a bunch of the stratagems instead of being stratagems became data sheet passive abilities. Um, I feel like and, and like uh Age of Sigmar fourth edition was kind of a similar vibe. I wouldn't be surprised if there was just like every every like special character has one data sheet passive and then like something that makes the warriors more viable. Um because I mean, I don't know. I, I'm always a fan of teams that have a couple warriors because it just kind of like gives you pieces that are easier to just like trade and instigate with. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm looking forward to a lot of stuff on the new edition. You know, obviously, Chris, we brought you here because we wanted to talk a little bit about the Alabama kill team scene. So how has the Alabama scene been reacting to some of the news from Hivestorm? Uh, I think it's been mostly positive and not just kill team, but also, you know, the other GW adjacent games. Um, so that's exciting because we do want to expand as much as we can on, on the kill team scene. And I think just from that preview that maybe this edition will allow us to have an easier time getting other folks involved in kill team so that's that's really that was the, mo the most exciting news is just how much more accessible it seems but yeah how have, say, what how many uh stores does alabama play out of where do you where are your tournaments you know obviously i found you because you were running a tournament in recent history so where's your local shop where are your players at how big is the group in alabama that you know of so the, the local store we play at is Gear Gaming, uh, that's in Hoover, Alabama. And I would say our our scene, you know, counting every player, there's probably like 12, 12 to 14-ish players. Um, consistently, it's more like five, because there's always um, uh, a different rotation of people that show up every now and then. Uh, to, you know, if it's either because of new games or just new editions coming out, like obviously AOS pulled some players out, and then 10th edition pulled some players out, and new ones came in. Um, and that's our core Birmingham, Alabama area. I know there's an area um, in North Alabama, and we have a few players that come to our tournaments, and we've gone to theirs. And then South Alabama, there's a couple stores, just one in Dothan and one in Mobile. And I think they're running a tournament there in September. We're also going to run one in September. But I would say those four areas are the, the main uh, areas in the state. How often do you guys have tournaments? Is it like a monthly thing or a quarterly thing? It, it Ideally, it was a monthly thing, but we've had a few we've had a few issues with the weekends not working for like different clusters of players. We're like six players can make it this weekend or five and then like the next one other five others but we can never get like a big one and 
we didn't necessarily want to run like a three to five player. I mean, obviously a three player event doesn't make sense, but even five feels, you know, kind of bad. Um, definitely don't want to have a buy round at a five player event. And I, I found that, you know, I used to play Magic the Gathering pretty competitively and the demographic mm-hmm. of Magic versus Warhammer in general is a lot different. Uh, you have Magic is young kids, usually college age, high school. They have a lot of spare time. Not a lot of responsibilities, <laughs> whereas the Warhammer group is more definitely, you know, uh, older with families, and it's definitely a lot harder to uh, schedule things. I don't know if that's been your experience in New York or or if you played other games where the demographic is a bit different. Yeah, I think that's generally kind of the same uh, here in Minnesota as well. Yeah, I think as far as player demographics go, Warhammer tends to skew on the older side. One, probably because we all were kids when Warhammer was kind of popping off when we were younger. It was like we were 14 to 18 playing fourth or fifth edition Warhammer. And then, you know, we stopped playing and then it feels like there's kind of like this wave of people who are like, oh, what's Warhammer like? And I kind of am expecting Space Marine 2, which looks really cool to be one of those other inflection points in the near future. Yeah, and, and I guess to add to what you said, obviously it's the the buy-in to play Warhammer is pretty high compared to other games, and that definitely affects the demographic. I'm hoping that you know this new edition is going to do a lot of work on at least making that first intro point easier for players because I think right now with all the rule books, it just seems insane to tell someone like, "Oh, it's just one box and like 16 books." <laughs> so yeah. that's not great. So if we can have all the rules online and that's the core experience, then it'll be easy to be like, it's one box, come play with us, it's fun. And then you can get to the point where people are painting up their guys. And it, instead of it being a story about some space marines or some Vespids that you see on a cinematic trailer, it's the story of your Vespids and your space marines. And that's really, I think, the part that makes Kill Team and Warhammer and miniature games in general that much more immersive once you're all the way in because it's not just a random story it's not magic the gathering where it's the story of these planeswalkers the story of these ones it's it's really your guys you painted them it might be the ultramarines with calgar but it's your squad of ultramarines with calgar so it sounds like the player base is kind of scattered in alabama with a still some work to grow and it sounds like the players are getting a little bit hyped up over kill team 2024 i assume is what we're going to end up calling it because it's the three year on the dot just like the other things do you have any big plans for release events you know it sounds like it's going to be somewhere in the october range do you guys have any or do you are you scheming up any plans in the alabama area to kind of bring in the newer players yeah, I I would like to, and I'm, I probably will end up running some kind of, not necessarily a tournament, because I think the the war tournament also just scares people away a lot. And it's funny, because like, once people try it and play it, they're like, oh my god, I had the best time. But they just hear this war tournament, and they get kind of turned off or, uh, you know, intimidated by it. Um, but maybe setting up some kind of event where it's just a, a teach-kill team. Um, maybe like a couple Sundays or a Sunday a month or something like that, just to get people to show up and even try to get, because you never know, you might not like it and you might like it. They end up showing up again and we can grow the community even more. Yeah, we're definitely going, we've got uh, weekly game nights over here, just like casual, like show up and and do pickup games. So I'm sure we're going to like, we've got a handful of people that are already doing a great job being community leaders, teaching a lot of players. Um, so like, especially with the solo and co-op mode, like we kind of chatted about at the beginning, I think that's going to be an amazing tool for teaching new players. So we'll just kind of like make sure we have everything on hand to be able to pull that off for new players, learning games, stuff like that. Um, definitely looking forward to that. Um, the New York open, it's, it's looking like that might be a uh, third edition probably, unless by October, they mean like the very last day. Correct. So for anyone who's listening, who's curious what the New York open is going to be, I am fully dedicated to getting all of the rules into my brain and running New York open three on the new edition of kill team. Turns out that picking the November, October range has been pretty good for kill team because there's generally a big release <laughs> reasonably around the New York open. And this year is no is going to be no stranger to that I am fully planning to try and run it unless it somehow releases on October 26th, in which case maybe we won't. But even then, I probably would just expect that everybody wants to play in the new edition would just do it live and run into all of the rakes and figure it out. 
<laughs> so for anyone who hasn't gotten your tickets for the New York Open, you know, and you really want to play maybe one of the first couple of tournaments on the new edition in a large at a large scale, it'll be there October 26th, 27th. Tickets are on sale. We'll have links in the podcast description. Yeah, be a big tournament pioneer in third edition. <laughs> Is it always that weekend? The last of October? Uh, this year is going to be the last of October. The last couple of years, we did it in the first week of November, and that ended up running into issues with the New York City Marathon. So now we've moved it to the last weekend of October to try to get around that. And here we are. We'll see how it goes. Is it Halloween theme? Uh, it won't be Halloween <laughs> theme. We are in a middle school, so it might be a school theme. We might have our TOs with hall monitor sashes just because it'll be fun. <laughs> nice. I was wondering, is there usually a cutoff with, or the cutoffs, uh, cutoff dates for new rules and stuff, is that enforced by GW or is that usually a TO decision? No, it's always been a TO decision. For okay. for my part at running ACO and a couple other small events, I have generally understood the rules quick enough where whatever GW decides to do, I will pick as the standard. So the week, the last year at the height of Melee Summer, when the Chaos Cults had just come out, I was not intending to run them at ACO. Mm -hmm. But because GW ran an event the week before ACO and did run it with Chaos Cults and Inquisition, I also let them in. And then, of course, Chaos Cults took, uh, I think, first, third, and fourth, and fifth or something. Not too shabby. You know, Chaos Cults are very good for all of last year. And then we got rid of them, and then we played Commandos for the better part of, you know, six months. <laughs> what What'd you like better? Uh, Commandos meta or <laughs> Cult meta? I think ultimately Chaos Cult at the local level were never at the height of their power compared to how they got abused at the World Championships where people were just staging up with two Torments at the beginning of turn two, both of them with a damage mitigation bubble that you just couldn't interact with. So I don't think it ever really got that bad. So I think Commandos felt a little bit more overbearing because one, more players played Commandos and two, Commandos are more obviously powerful. So you get to the synergy points for Commandos much faster because because turns out when they were at their most powerful, three operatives all with guns and dynamite sitting on conceal outside of your deployment was just much harder to interact with than whatever most people played Chaos Cults as. I don't know how it was in Alabama when they were at the height of their power and when you were touching them, Chris. Um, I, I felt bad because I really enjoyed just the team. Like when I saw the the spoilers, I got really excited. Like, oh, I'm going to get this box. This box is great. It's got a bunch of sprues for those are one of the best value boxes probably from for as a, you know, Oh yeah, for sure. It was a good amount of plastic. You got two cool teams. You got like a whole new way to play. Yeah. Um, and I played them a couple of times and I'm like, oh, this this team doesn't make any sense. I'm just gonna put it up for now. <laughs> I did play it at ATC last year and then lost the commandos in the finals. Yeah, I think before the world championships, that was what everyone thought would be the natural counter, but at the World Championships, it turned out that if you have enough heavy, you can actually just stage all of your Chaos Cultists behind piece of his, pieces of heavy or forward, forward deploy them by using covert guises and basically pushing up your entire army into a spot where commandos, even with three forward deploys, aren't going to shoot you in turn one. And if you can do that every game, it ended up being, oh, it turns out that Chaos Cults were really good. Yeah. Despite, what, three nerfs at that point or four? Three. Yep. Yep. And then, <laughs> you know, right after World Championships, one more big fat one. <laughs> Yeah, I think if you count erratas and FAQs, it's like five or six nerfs. Because back when I played them, uh, you know, Get Down Mr. President was also really stupid still. A team with almost no equal at the height of their power, that's for sure. Yeah, I think, you know, of the teams that we talked to about today, you know, a little bit of Chaos Cults, a little bit of Commandos, and Novitiates, and Hearthkin Salvagers. Hopefully, we'll, all of them will be super fun in the new edition. If Obscurity is is less annoying or other things change you know obviously on these really dense boards novitiates and hearth consolvers probably do okay right just because now the movement on the hearth consolvers doesn't matter as much and novitiates still have all their all their tricks and now the pregoddesses maybe can actually do move shoot dash back into cover right yeah that's definitely definitely a possibility i'm really excited to see how it's gonna uh, turn out for sure I'll be getting a yeah, box. Here's hoping. Way. Yeah, here's hoping that the great gun in the cinematic trailer somehow makes an appearance as a piece of terrain eventually, <laughs> because that would be a sweet thing to have as the background. Or like someone make it as part of your display board or something. One of the cool things in that cinematic is I think as the scions are dropping into the loading bay, that's actually just the bullet loading bay of the great <laughs> gun. 
All right. Well, you know, we're getting towards the end of the podcast. You know, what are we most excited for with Hive Storm and the new edition? I'm kind of excited to see if teams get like streamlined and merged together. Like, I mean, I like as far as sisters go, it'd be cool if there was some hybrid version of like novitiates and regular sisters of battle. And like, if that was an option, that'd be cool. Um, or like green skins and commandos being slammed into one thing. That's super, super customizable. Um, like add some more space Marines into the mix. I don't know. Uh, this is totally just, there's unfounded, but that'd be cool. Yeah, I wouldn't mind. What about you, Chris? What are you excited for? I wouldn't mind some kind of shakeup like that for sure. Because I, you know, right now we don't really know how much is changing. Like the biggest change is that kill stuff, and um, I guess the scouting stuff is different. But I don't know. As far as what excites me most, I think it's still just the the free rules and the accessibility. Just yeah, I'm excited that I think a lot of new players are going to start playing kill team, uh, and that's you know the biggest factor for a game to thrive is having people that play the game. So. Yeah. What about you, Travis? Yeah, I'm I'm personally excited for a new take on Vespid, getting new models mm-hmm. that, you know, update a thing that I always wanted as a kid because I fought against Necrons back in the day and I really wish that I could have Strength 5 AP2 weaponry. But <laughs> now we're playing Kill Team and I'm really excited to get a stealth suit in the mainline game that actually is a Vespid. So very curious to see how those rules look. And who knows, maybe there will even be some other version of a Tau kill team with stealth suits and fire warriors and that could be very cool as well yeah honestly stealth suits being like a valid thing would be extremely cool because they are i love just vibe the vibes are there yes and i have a few stealth suits already painted from companion tournament a few years ago so (laughs) all right chris thanks for coming in talking a little bit about the alabama scene hopefully your next couple tournaments go well and you know thanks again for coming on talking about novitius and hard yeah thank you guys for having me Thank you listeners for listening until the end.